This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 10 for May 29 to June 4, The New Covenant. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've been studying in your word about the covenants, the covenants that occurred over time, and now we come to the new covenant, and we just want to thank you for that, because Hebrews describes it as a better covenant. We pray that as we study today, that we will have our relationship, our covenant with you, re-certified, re-energized, because your Holy Spirit will work in our lives as we understand more what your word means to us and what the great salvation offered by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ means to each of us. Bless us now, we pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Let's read that again. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. A cartoon in a magazine years ago showed a business executive in an office standing before other executives. He was holding a box of detergent in his hands showing it to the other men and women. He proudly pointed to the word NEW that was displayed in large red letters on the box, the implication being, of course, that the product was NEW. The executive then said, It's the NEW on the box that is NEW. In other words, all that changed, all that was NEW, was simply the word NEW on the box. Everything else was the same. In a sense... We could say that the new covenant is like that. The basis of the covenant, the basic hope that it has for us, its basic conditions are the same as what was found in the old covenant. It has always been a covenant of God's grace and mercy, a covenant based on a love that transcends human foibles and defeats. And now for the week at a glance. What parallels exist between the old and new covenants? What role does the law play in the covenant? With whom were the covenants made? What does the book of Hebrews mean by a better covenant? Well, let's have a look in Hebrews 8 verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. What relation is there between the covenant and the heavenly sanctuary. Sunday, May 30. Behold, the days are coming. Read Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and answer the following questions. 1. Who instigates the covenant? 2. Whose law is being talked about here? What law is this? 3. Which verses stress the relational aspect that God wants with his people? And 4. What act of God, in behalf of his people, forms the basis of that covenant relationship. Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. 
from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. It is clear. The new covenant is not so different from the old covenant made with Israel on Mount Sinai. In fact, the problem with the Sinai covenant was not that it was old or outmoded. The problem instead was that it was broken, as we read in verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. The answers to the above questions, all found in these four verses, prove that many facets of the old covenant remain in the new one. The new covenant is, in a sense, a renewed covenant. It is the completion or the fulfilment of the first one. Focus on the last part of Jeremiah 31, verse 34, in which the Lord says that he will forgive their iniquity and the sin of his people. Let's just read that. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Even though the Lord says that he will write the law on our hearts and place it within us, he still stresses that he will forgive our sin and iniquity which violates the law written in our hearts. Do you see any contradiction or tension between these ideas? If not, why not? What does it mean, as Romans 2.15 puts it, to have the law written within our hearts? And we... We'll just read that. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. And then we also look at Matthew 5, verses 17 to 28. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that... Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But... Whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Looking at the verses for today, how could you use them to answer the argument that somehow the Ten Commandments, or specifically the Sabbath, are now made void under the New Covenant? Is there anything at all in those texts that makes that point? On the contrary, how could one use those texts to prove the perpetuity of the law? Monday, May 31. Heart Work At the time when the southern kingdom of Judah was about to end, 
and the people were to be taken into Babylonian captivity, God announced through his prophet Jeremiah the new covenant. This is the first time this nation is expressed in the Bible. However, when the ten-tribe northern kingdom of Israel was about to be destroyed, some 150 years before the time of Jeremiah, the idea of another covenant was mentioned again, this time by Hosea. And that can be found in Hosea 2, verses 18 to 20. Read Hosea 2, 18 to 20. Notice the parallel between what the Lord said there to his people and what he said in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. What common imagery is used? And again, what does it say about the basic meaning and nature of the covenant? First of all, Hosea 2, 18 to 20, In that day I will make a covenant for them, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth, to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me. In righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And let's compare that with Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. At moments in history when God's plans for his covenant people were hampered by their rebellion and unbelief, he sent prophets to proclaim that the covenant history with his faithful had not come to an end. No matter how unfaithful the people might have been, no matter the apostasy, rebellion and disobedience among them, the Lord still proclaims his willingness to enter into a covenant relationship with all who are willing to repent to obey and to claim his promises. Look up the following texts. Though they do not specifically mention a new covenant, what elements are found in them that reflect the principles behind the new covenant? Ezekiel 11 and verse 19, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart of out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. And Ezekiel eighteen thirty one, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And Ezekiel 36, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Lord will provide a heart to know that I am the Lord, it says in Jeremiah 24, 7. He will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, as it reads in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, and will give a new heart and a new spirit in Ezekiel thirty six twenty six. He also says in Ezekiel thirty six twenty seven, I will put my spirit within you. The whole verse reads, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. This work of God is the foundation of the new covenant. And so to finish today, if someone came to you and said, I want a new heart, I want the law written in my heart, I want a heart to know the Lord, but I don't know how to get it. What would you say to that person?
Tuesday, June 1, Old and New Covenants Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7 read, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be His servants, every one who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Jeremiah states that the new covenant is to be made with the house of Israel in Jeremiah 31 verse 33. Does this mean then that only the literal seed of Abraham, Jews by blood and birth, are to receive the covenant promises? No. In fact, that was not even true in Old Testament times. That the Hebrew nation as a whole had been given the covenant promises is, of course, correct. Yet it was not done to the exclusion of anyone else. On the contrary, all Jew or Gentile were invited to partake of the promises, but they had to agree to enter into that covenant. It is certainly no different today. Read the above texts in Isaiah. What conditions do they place on those who want to serve the Lord? Is there really any difference in what God asked of them and what he asks of us today? Explain your answer. Isaiah 56 verses 6 and 7 and this time from the New King James Version. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Though the new covenant is called better, as we'll see in tomorrow's lesson, there really is no difference in the basic elements that make up both the old and new covenants. It is the same God who offers salvation the same way by grace. As we read in Exodus 34 and verse 6, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And Romans 3.24, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is the same God who seeks a people who by faith will claim his promises of forgiveness, as we read in Jeremiah 31 verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And Hebrews 8 verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It is the same God who seeks to write the law into the hearts of those who will follow him in a faith relationship. Jeremiah 31 verse 33, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And Hebrews 8 verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So it is, whether they be Jew or Gentile. In the New Testament, the Jews responded to the election of grace, received Jesus Christ and his gospel. For a time, they were the heart of the church, the remnant chosen by grace, as we read in Romans 11.5, in contrast to those who were hardened in verse 7. At the same time, the Gentiles, who formerly did not believe, accepted the gospel and were grafted into God's true people, made up of believers, no matter the people or race to which they belonged, as we read in Romans 11, 13-24. 
For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, and the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but that the root supports you. You will say then, Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. But if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So the Gentiles at that time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, as we read in Ephesians 2.12, were brought near in the blood of Christ. Christ is mediating the new covenant, as we read in Hebrews 9.15, for all believers, regardless of nationality or race. Wednesday, June 2, A Better Covenant Our text for today is Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Yesterday we saw that, regarding the basic elements, the old and new covenants were the same. The bottom line is salvation by faith in a God who will forgive our sins, not because of anything worthy in us, but only because of His grace. As a result of His forgiveness, we enter into a relationship with Him in which we surrender to Him in faith and obedience. Nevertheless, the book of Hebrews does call the new covenant a better covenant. How do we understand what that means? How is one covenant better than the other? Question, where did the fault lie with the failure of the old covenant? Hebrews 8 verses 7 and 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. The problem with the Old Covenant was not with the covenant itself, but with the failure of the people to grasp it in faith. As we read in Hebrews 4 verse 2, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The superiority of the new to the old lies in the fact that Jesus, instead of being revealed only through the animal sacrifices, as in the old covenant, now appears in the reality of his death and high priestly ministry. In other words, the salvation offered in the old covenant is the same offered in the new. In the new, however, a greater, more complete revelation of the God of the covenant and the love that he has for fallen humanity has been revealed. 
It is better in that everything that has been taught through symbols and types in the Old Testament has found its fulfilment in Jesus, whose sinless life, his death, and high priestly ministry were symbolized by the earthly sanctuary service, as we read in Hebrews 9, verses 8 to 14. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, though, instead of symbols, types, and examples, we have Jesus himself, not only as the slain lamb who shed his blood for our sin, as we read in Hebrews 9.12, but also as the one who stands as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, ministering on our behalf. Hebrews 9.12 reads, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And Hebrews 7.25 reads, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Though the salvation he offers is the same, this fuller revelation of himself and the salvation found in him, as revealed in the new covenant, make it superior to the old. Read Hebrews 8 verse 5 and Hebrews 10 verse 1. What word does the author use to describe the old covenant sanctuary services? How does the use of that word help us to understand the superiority of the new covenant? Hebrews 8 verse 5 reads, Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And Hebrews 10 1, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Think about this as we finish today's study. Why would knowing about Christ's life, death and high priestly ministry on our behalf give us a better understanding of God than one would get merely from the earthly sanctuary service ritual of animal sacrifices. Thursday, June 3, The New Covenant Priest The book of Hebrews places a heavy emphasis on Jesus as our High Priest in the heavenly sanctuary. In fact, the clearest exposition of the New Covenant found in the New Testament appears in the book of Hebrews with its emphasis on Christ as High Priest. This is no coincidence. Christ's heavenly ministry is intricately tied to the promises of the New Covenant. 
the Old Testament sanctuary service was the means by which the Old Covenant truths were taught. It centred on sacrifice and mediation. Animals were slain and their blood was mediated by the priests. These, of course, were all symbols of the salvation found only in Jesus. There was no salvation found in them, in and of themselves. Read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Why is there no salvation found in the death of these animals? Why is the death of an animal not sufficient to bring salvation? Hebrews 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. All these sacrifices and the priestly mediation that accompanied them met their fulfilment in Christ. Jesus became the sacrifice upon which the blood of the new covenant is placed. Christ's blood ratified the new covenant, making the Sinaitic covenant and its sacrifices old or void. The true sacrifice has been made once and for all, as we read in Hebrews 9.26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once Christ died, there was no more need for any animals to be slain. The earthly sanctuary services had fulfilled their function. Read Matthew 27, verse 51, which tells how the veil in the earthly sanctuary was torn when Jesus died. How does that event help us to understand that the earthly sanctuary had been superseded? Matthew 27, verse 51, Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Tied, of course, to these animal sacrifices was the priestly ministry. Those Levites who offered and mediated the sacrifices in the earthly sanctuary on behalf of the people. Once the sacrifices ended, the need for their ministry ended as well. Everything had been fulfilled in Jesus, who now ministers his own blood in the sanctuary in heaven, as you read in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 5. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all these things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain." Hebrews stresses Christ as high priest in heaven, having entered by shedding his own blood, as we read in Hebrews 9.12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Mediating on our behalf. This is the foundation of the hope and promise we have in the new covenant. So, to finish the day, how does it make you feel, understanding that even now Jesus is ministering his blood in heaven on your behalf? How much confidence and assurance does that give you regarding salvation? Friday, June 4. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 659, written by Ellen White, we read, In partaking with his disciples of the bread and wine, Christ pledged himself to them as their Redeemer. He committed to them the new covenant, by which all who receive him become children of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
by this covenant every blessing that heaven could bestow for this life and the life to come was theirs. This covenant deed was to be ratified with the blood of Christ, and the administration of the sacrament was to keep before the disciples the infinite sacrifice made for each of them individually as a part of the great whole of fallen humanity. End of quote. And from the same writer, page 138 of God's Amazing Grace, the most striking feature of this covenant of peace is the exceeding richness of the pardoning mercy expressed to the sinner if he repents and turns from his sin. The Holy Spirit describes the gospel as salvation through the tender mercies of our God. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, the Lord declares of those who repent, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8.12 does God turn from justice in showing mercy to the sinner? No. God cannot dishonour his law by suffering it to be transgressed with impunity. Under the new covenant, perfect obedience is the condition of life. If the sinner repents and confesses his sin, he will find pardon. By Christ's sacrifice in his behalf, forgiveness is secured for him. Christ has satisfied the demands of the law for every repentant, believing sinner. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what is the advantage of having the law written in the heart rather than on tablets of stone alone? Which is easy to forget, the law written on stones or the law written in the heart? Two, Ever since the fall of humanity, salvation has been found only through Jesus, even if the revelation of that truth varied in different epochs of history. Do not the covenants work the same way? 3. Look at the second Ellen G. White quote in today's study. What does she mean by perfect obedience as the requirement for a covenant relationship? Who is the only one who has rendered perfect obedience? How does that obedience answer the demands of the law for us? And so to summarise this week's lesson, the new covenant is a greater, more complete and better revelation of the plan of redemption. We who partake of it, partake of it by faith. A faith that will manifest itself in obedience to a law written in our hearts. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled A Church for Tourists and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. The new pastor was shocked when he showed up at the Bucharest International Seventh-day Adventist Church, the only English-speaking church in Romania's capital, and found only three people present. All three were Romanian. Three weeks later, Pastor Benjamin Stan learned that one of those three, a 21-year-old woman, was leaving. He wondered why God had led him to a dead church. Why am I here? he prayed. Why did you give me this call? At that moment, two American tourists walked in the door. Benjamin realised that tourists need a place to worship. He kept praying. A couple of weeks later, he found a man dressed in a suit and tie waiting outside the church. The man lived with his family in Poland and worked in Romania. He belonged to another Christian church, but, after studying the Bible, wanted a Sabbath-keeping church. Benjamin realised that there are foreigners who work in Romania but don't speak Romanian. They need a place to worship. After several months, Benjamin suggested holding Sabbath school and the divine worship service on Sabbath mornings. Until then, the church didn't have a Sabbath school, and its hour-long worship service took place on Sabbath evenings. The two members opposed the proposal. They went to Romanian churches on Sabbath mornings and didn't want to lose those friends. But Benjamin was insistent. We do not come here to study English, he said. We come here to study the Bible. We need to be a church. 
Visiting other churches, Benjamin invited two teens and a man of about 30 to help organise the worship programme. He advertised the new morning worship schedule on social media. That first Sabbath, 32 people showed up. You should have seen the expressions on the face of the two members when they arrived, Benjamin recalled. Their eyes were big. They were surprised when they saw so many people, especially young people, in the church. The Polish man was baptised several weeks later. Today, Benjamin has no doubt that the church, started by Pastor Adrian Bocaneo in 2010, serves an important role in Bucharest. It has 26 members and weekly attendance ranges from 30 to 50 people, including tourists, foreign workers and international students. What happened to those three people who attended the church on Benjamin's first Sabbath? They are now very involved, including the young woman who left. She is now a church leader. And there's a photograph of Pastor Adrian here in front of a building. Connect with the Bucharest International Seventh-day Adventist Church at facebook.com slash English Adventist. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.